Hi there. So I put together this video for how we can best section brain chunks on a vibratome. And although this is some knowledge that can be taught in any given lab, there are some little tricks and additions that I've made that I want to impart to students that I work with. And in particular, in case any of these tricks are helpful for other people working on this elsewhere, wherever you are, uh, hopefully something good will come of it. So uh, without further ado, I want to talk about sectioning whole brain hemispheres with a vibratome. Video is included. This is not just a slideshow. So a quick checklist of things to go over as far as what you should expect when you're trying to vibratome section should include the following. You want to, in our case, hemisect the rodent brain, or if you're trying to figure out whether you should hemisect or not, why we might not want to hemisect the brain into two different hemispheres. Beyond that, we still need to divide the brain tissue usually into chunks to create a flat surface to mount onto the vibratome's station or chuck, sometimes it's called. Otherwise, uh, if we don't have a flat surface, then there's not going to be much to bind it down to that chuck, and you won't be able to cut it if it's wobbling around. One thing that we do in order to stabilize the blade as it's cutting through brain chunks is that we apply agarose. So we have to melt uh, a agarose gelatin kind of solution and then put it over the brain chunks and thus embedding them in this agarose. These now embedded brain chunks with their agarose medium solidified around them are glued onto that vibratome chuck. We'll go over some of the vibratome setup and settings in the video. And I'll also talk a little bit about how I and others section in series. This is a particularly important consideration when we're trying to do multiple rounds of staining and the fact that in tissue sectioning, traditional sectioning anyway, uh, we usually cannot de-stain and re-stain the same tissue. So we have to be decisive with how we collect tissue in the first place. Of course, sometimes you might be pressed for time. So knowing how to store embedded chunks uh, is also important. That way you don't have to worry about sectioning at all in one day or wasting brain tissue even worse. So what is hemisecting? Uh, it is dividing the brain into its separate hemispheres. So we have left brain versus right brain. This is true of pretty much anything that has a brain. And we can divide this into the different hemispheres. This is also known as a mid-sagittal cut. So this is down the midline of the brain. So we have here the midline of the brain has a crevice separating the two hemispheres. Uh, we also have the cerebellum that just kind of goes across both hemispheres, but we still would be dividing that and the underlying brain stem. And so when we're trying to do a mid-sagittal cut, we might take just an average razor blade through the top, as you'll see later, and then we will have two separate hemispheres. Now, why we do this? Well, we can just reduce the volume of tissue that we collect, especially if we're only interested in analyzing just one of the two hemispheres. So in regards to that, let's say that you did some sort of behavioral experiment uh, and then CFOS or some marker of activity or, or something else is generally upregulated or cranked up in the brain in specific areas. But let's also say that it's cranked up in these areas equally in both hemispheres, or otherwise very, very, very similarly in both hemispheres. So basically, if you're not expecting any differences between left and right hemispheres, especially in a rodent brain, there isn't really a need to have to cut through all of it. As we cut sections, if we have both brain hemispheres there, what'll happen is that they'll take up more room on a slide, uh, we'll end up using more slides because we are having fewer slices per uh, slide. And there will just be more area to have to analyze as well. Because if you're interested in just, you know, one hemisphere, 
you might just take pictures of one hemisphere unless you expect to see differences between left and right. So really, it's just kind of a waste of space, waste of time, waste of tissue. So that's part of the reason why I thought, why just not hemisect? And as far as what you do with the hemisphere, you don't cut. So let's say we picked left or right hemisphere. Let's say we picked different hemispheres between different animals in a project. Or let's say we always stuck with left hemisphere first. And the other hemisphere we don't immediately delegate to sectioning on the vibratome. That can be stowed away and saved for various purposes. First and foremost, let's say we start with the left hemisphere. We section all of it down on the vibratome. And we have multiple batches of tissue from that left hemisphere. But let's say a year or so goes by and we've exhausted all the tissue that we've collected from that left hemisphere. Well, we still have a backup the right hemisphere, and we could section all that down and get a whole nother few batches of tissue to use up out after that. So we basically doubled the amount of information we can extract from one whole brain just by hemisecting it. Additionally, though, something that's a little bit more of a modern approach is let's say we section the tissue to use more traditional staining techniques on the sections. But then the other hemisphere we do not section on the vibratome could be delegated toward a more three-dimensional tissue analysis approach. These include things like clarity, cubic, switch, shield, and there are various other names, uh, other acronyms. All these, the premise is that we somehow make the tissue transparent. That way, when we try to use imaging with it, specifically fluorescence imaging, it can see far, far deeper into the brain. So an example of what happens here is we have tissue that has had the lipids removed from it. And also uh, it has been immersed in a solution where it matches the refractive index of the solution. So we basically make the brain see through. This makes the fluorescent analysis under a microscope that much uh, more effective. You can go in at very deep depths and thus not have to section the tissue. This is the new ideal where if you have a microscope that can do it, and if you can stain these thick chunks of tissue or whole brain hemispheres in this case, then it completely circumvents all the time and effort needed to section. And additionally, some of these technologies allow for de-staining and re-staining the whole hemisphere. So we're not losing one hemisphere just by doing one round of this, we could continue to reuse it again and again using these technologies. For more information, you can see these links uh, displayed here. Clarity is something that Carl Dyseroth's lab had developed several years ago. And uh, although some similar technologies existed, this kind of really set the stage for follow up techniques to improve upon it. Uh, I had used Cubic a few times uh, in my work just sort of uh, minorly, and I like it, but I think for deeper tissue staining and uh, visible visualization of those stains, switch and shield are ones that I've keeping been keeping my eye on that I do suggest you look into as well. Okay, so all this is putting up a really good argument for hemisecting the brain. But we don't always want to do that. We don't want to just automatically hemisect brains that we have. And so one reason why we may not is if we have a unilateral manipulation on the brain. So if you're expecting some hemispheric differences because you did a unilateral manipulation, or if maybe there are weird lateralized things in the rodent brain, you may not want to hemisect. Uh, if you're ever working with more um, uh, larger brains, it, like let's say we're working with a whole human brain, we know that there are highly lateralized functions between the left and the right hemisphere. Uh, some other species might have sexual dimorphisms where the left and right hemispheres might have slight differences. So that would be where we don't want to hemisect. Or in this example, let's say we are stimulating this place called the lateral hypothalamus deep within the brain. And we're stimulating just the left hemisphere. So this is a unilateral stimulation, one side, unilateral. And so the question might arise, okay, if we're stimulating this brain region and it causes an animal to 
do some sort of behaviors, what brain regions in turn are being turned on by the stimulation aside from the lateral hypothalamus? In other words, what downstream areas might be activated? Might there be a whole network of things that turn on? How can we actually see those? Well, we can stain for markers of activity like CFOS, but the question remains, what kind of activity might occur in the hemisphere that was stimulated and what activity may or may not occur in the hemisphere that did not receive direct stimulation? So to depict this, let's say we have, again, our picture of a brain. We put a stimulating electrode deep into the brain here. And so we expect that, sure, this is going to light up when we look for markers of activity by staining. But then if we hemisect, then we're not going to have any information about what happens in the other hemisphere where the electrode was not implanted. So this would be one example where we don't want to hemisect, especially if we want to look within the same exact section, the opposite hemisphere is lateral hypothalamus. Does that happen to turn on even though the electrode isn't over there? It's only in the left hemisphere. So does the right hemisphere's uh, lateral hypothalamus turn on? And so this is one key example of why we wouldn't hemisect a brain. But if you're dealing with some situation where an animal was treated behaviorally in some paradigm and you don't expect differences between the hemispheres, I highly suggest hemisecting. So consider what will work best for you. All that out of the way, uh, how to hemisect I have iterated in this video. You'll see two examples. First example will be where we use a brain mold shaped like the outer parts of the rat brain in order to holster it so that we could cut the brain first into a back and front half. And then we take those back and front halves and cut them further into halves uh, down the midline, respectively. Alternatively, we could cut the whole brain straight down the midline, uh, as shown in some earlier pictures in these slides, and then in order to create a flat surface to mount on the, the ribosome right chuck, we cut each of those hemispheres into a front half and back half. Now, pros and cons briefly. Uh, the, if we were to do the second approach, this still can allow us to leave an entire hemisphere fully intact without cutting into front and back. If we were to do the first approach, then we would already have things cut between front and back. So in case we ever want to see some sort of whole neuron pathway going from front of the brain to the back of the brain, we would not want to cut it down if we want to do some of those 3D tissue clearing and staining techniques. Alternatively, though, the brain mold might give a little bit more precision in how we do the front half versus back half and then cut that down further into uh, smaller chunks. So it's up to you and what works. There might be only very slight differences for most people working with this though. Okay, so we have our brain tissue in this vial here in PBS and some sodium azide. So we'll take this out and then just very briefly dry it off here. Now, there are two possible approaches to hemisecting. One is that we just slice it as is right here on this paper towel. Alternatively, we could try to fit it into this brain mold, and this is usually a upside down kind of situation. But since we also have to cut the brain hemisections in half themselves, so basically quartering the brain, then I'm going to go for the second option here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to make sure to press this down. I think we actually have to flip this around a little bit to get it to fit properly. And we make sure that it is aligned, seated in there. And we have all these grooves here in order to align a razor blade. Uh, new and sharp, so sharp's hazard. And so, when applying this, we're going to very carefully sink this down again, make sure the brain's lined up, and then we will put it into one of these grooves. We want to cut the brain basically in half to make sure that neither half is too tall. 
So I'm going to aim it to be right about here. Maybe a little bit more forward, like here. So it'll fit into this groove, and then we will just align it and then press down. And that should be that. So we'll take a look, see if the cut is good. So if we take a look at the base of this brain here, we see that the hemispheres look, oop, hemispheres look relatively similar from one side to the other. So I think that we're good. We could also check it on this other chunk over here. So as long as things are lining up, then we're good. And then what makes it easier is that when we actually put these flat now, we might be able to uh, do the hemisection a little bit more simply. So what we can do now is we can aim straight down the midline and then use that midline in order to hemisect properly. Being careful to maintain alignment the whole time through there. Okay, so now we've hemisected the front half of the brain. Get that to drop off. We can always snip off some of that excess in a second. Apologies for the wobbly camera, I'm trying to do two things at once. And then we attempt to do the same thing with the hind brain here. Starting with the brain stem, lining it up, and then slowly sinking it down, making sure to maintain the blade perpendicular to the surface to make sure it's a straight up and down cut, not at any slant. Let me take a look at where it's sitting on the blade here, and that looks like it's actually perfectly between the two hemispheres. Okay. So we'll just kind of move that off. And any sort of excess we could snip through that might be binding the two hemispheres together. There we go. All right. We can hemisect the brain by just placing a razor blade straight between the hemispheres and making sure that it is aligned completely up and down, so completely vertical, not any sort of slant going forward or backward or side to side. So you want to make sure that the cut is as straight as possible. Now that we have our hemisected hemisphere, we can divide it into chunks. When we have a hemisected piece, we want to divide it further into half again, and that is so that we have flat sides in order to glue down to the vibratome chuck. Now we want to make sure that this is aligned properly, so right now uh, we have the cut side down of this hemisected section, and we want to cut this again in half. Where to place the blade is to some degree up to you, but ideally you want to put it midway between the forebrain and the hindbrain, or front half and back half of the brain. And additionally, you want to make sure that the blade isn't cutting at a slant, and that the brain itself is also aligned straight, as shown here. So we don't want it to be angled uh, up or down in a sort of cockeyed direction. So one example of having it angled, which could lead to a really bad cut, would be if we angled like that, or even something more subtle where it was angled, maybe a little bit down like that, that could lead to a problematic cut. If you're not sure exactly how to align it, you can refer to the inset of the Brain Atlas, which we have right here. And so in this case, we see that it kind of creates this sort of wedge shape, and the brainstem also comes out uh, relatively straight out the back. So we take a look over here. This seems to be aligned appropriately. And we will aim our razor blade in between the two halves. 
All right, so we're going to cut this hemi section in half now. I'm going to carefully aim the blade again straight up and down. The camera just happens to be at an angle. So going straight overhead looks something like this. And so now I'm going to lower it through uh, about where the brain stem is starting to stick out the back here. So once again, line that up properly overhead for a good shot. Zoom that in. And lower. There we go. And you can see it comes right apart. So let's just push that off, separate out the two pieces. And the reason why you want to cut around that spot is that the two pieces, when put flat side down onto the vibrotome chuck, will be about equally tall, as we could see here. When preparing our brain chunks to be immersed in agarose, we want to make sure that they are the flat side down, not on the hemisected side, but so that they're having the tips facing up. So. The very frontal tip of the brain should be facing upward, and we'll lower it flat into here. We're going to make sure that it's just dry, so I'm just going to dab it on a piece of paper towel. And we will lower it carefully into the center of this flexible mold here. So that's good. We'll do the same thing with this back half of the same hemisphere. Brief dry off and then lower it into here, into the center. Now we can have agarose pour over all this and then solidify it. So uh, we want to make sure that we have agarose in order to embed our brains. We have found that agarose, when it is softer than the brain tissue, seems to be a guide for the blade as it's sectioning the brain chunks that we'll be sectioning. For this next part, we have our low melting temperature agarose at 1% in distilled water. And this was dissolved and then re-solidified in the fridge. So we gotta melt it down so it can be good and goopy in order to actually apply it. So you'll notice here I have a secondary containment beaker in case there's eruption or spillover. I also have the lid very loosely on top of the conical tube here. You do not want the lid to be tight or sealed because the vial could explode from the heat. So we want to avoid that. Just have the lid loosely on there. We put it in a secondary container so that we don't have to pick up a hot vial, nor do we have to worry about spillover inside the microwave. After about 20 seconds in the microwave, this conical tube of about 30 ml of our agarose solution is now pretty much molten. You want to be cautious with picking it up, making sure that it's had some time to settle so that it's not going to erupt or bubble up on you. Be careful in picking it up in case it's still hot. This is not too hot to the touch. The liquid, however, might be rather molten. Now, in this case, we're going to carefully pour it into here and make sure not to displace the brain tissue. So I'm going to just pour it right over the top of the brain here. and we want to completely submerge that brain chunk. And we'll do the same for this other one as well. Okay. Now that these are both submerged, we want to escort them to the freezer where they'll be chilling out for about two minutes. Let me actually open the freezer since I don't have three hands. We're just going to put them in the open space there. Put them on top of a freezy pack up here. All right. So we have these uh, now solidified agarose uh, brain mold situations here. 
And so what we're gonna do is, these are a little bit squeezable and I will just kind of pinch the bottom to try to squeeze it out. And as long as they're chilled enough, they actually should pop right out like that. So we'll do one and then do a pinch with the second. Might need a little bit more pinching just to force it out. There we go. Now we have a lot of XX agarose and we need to shave that off because we don't want to collect all these sort of agarose chunks. We'll take that same razor blade from before and try to cut around where the brand chunk is. So you can go overhead for this. I'm basically gonna cut on this part of the brain here, just cut around this side, making sure I'm not cutting into the brain itself. I'm gonna cut over the brain on the top here. I'm gonna cut a sliver off to the side here. And then going to cut another chunk off the bottom here. Now, if you're a little bit more skilled, you could always shave off some corners off the top at certain angles, kind of like carefully over here. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that, we can just have it work as a block as it is. So we're lucky in that we have these sort of sticky pads. The thing about vibratoming sections is that when you put a section straight onto this black metal part, this vi the vibratome will never cut it down all the way. It has built-in stopping mechanisms to keep it from going all the way down to here so it doesn't cut metal into metal. The problem is that you have about, as we can see, almost one millimeter plus of tissue that ends up being remaining behind and being lost forever. So we want to try to avoid that by having something that the vibratome could potentially, even if accidentally cut into without any sort of major problems. In comes this sticky foam stuff. So it's sticky on both sides. We stuck one side down onto here that we could remove by scraping it off with a razor blade later. And the top side has a peel off uh, sticky protector thing here. So much like double-sided stickers. And so after pulling this off, even though this is sticky, what we found has been helpful to make extra sticky is by adding a thin layer of super glue. Now I say thin because if you're using a gel rather than the liquid stuff, you don't want to over uh, overindulge with how much you're putting on there because then when it solidifies, it's going to create like a barrier around the very base of the brain. So we're just going to push on this and then swab it across as evenly as possible, covering if possible, the entire foam block. All right, put the super glue aside for the moment. And now we carefully insert our first block here, face down, give it a light press. And it is a little off the side, but that's fine. I wanted to make sure there was another enough room for the other part of the block over here. Give it a press and we're good. So now we want to make sure we insert this into our basin properly. And the way it works in these, this brand of Vibratome is that we'll rotate it around so that we have this um, groove facing that direction. And then a screw will come in here to help hold this whole thing down into place. And so we obtain our screw that we have among our other stuff in here, hopefully. Where are you? <laughs> Make sure things don't go drifting away on you, otherwise we will lose supplies. We use a specialized screwdriver for it. Insert. Screw in tightly. Also notice that I've made all this in such a way that this is facing towards me where this lever is. This is important because when you insert this basin into our vibratome, so there's this open slot down here in the base that fits where the metal is and that helps it lower and uh, raise. We want to make sure the lever is facing toward us. So insert basin with lever on this side. If you do it a different way, like this, it will cause problems. The blade assembly will lock up with the metal and you can't unbind it without actually having to take things apart. It's a mess. It could destroy the machinery. So don't do that. So do it with the lever facing you. We will tighten it by pulling on this lever going this direction. So now it doesn't move. We're good. 
we can now insert our blade assembly where we have a new blade that has been tightened into here. We'll make sure the tilt is correct. So this is where the black part should be, uh, the bottom of the black part should be level with this metal um, holder here. And the blade thus will also be angled slightly down, not excessively so, not excessively little. Making sure that's tight, we will then screw it into here on the vibratome. Now, when we turn this on, it'll do some brief adjustments at first. And we should be good to start. We will set our measurement of how big we want our sections. Now, when they are prepped in agarose but not surrounded by solution, what I find is that 55 to 50 micron sections actually work rather well. We're going to try 50 and see how it goes. Additionally, when you're trying to set things up, make sure the frequency is appropriate. So that's between five and six is fine. Make sure the speed is appropriate. Uh, we do it at like nine on the setting here, but uh, we can slow it down if the sections are poorer quality as needed. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring this forward using the switch here. I'm gonna watch for it to cut into any sort of top aggro stuff or if it's cutting into any brain chunks. Now. Um, actually, before I do that, we want to line the blade up looking directly overhead to make sure it is behind the agarose, as we see here. And then we will hit this button over here once. It'll blink and then remain solid on. We will then bring the blade forward. We'll ignore the fact that it's cutting things, um, because we want to bring it forward to the point where the blade has now passed where the agarose ends when looking at it directly overhead. And even maybe a little further because we might want extra time to swab up sections. So someplace like here is definitely well past where the agarose ends. Now we press the button once more. This now has designated the start and stop points for every sweep when it does it again and again. If we did not do this, then it would try to go the entire full sweep of what the device could do, which is a time waster for sure. All right, we also want to set it to continuous. So that way it doesn't stop after every single one. If you want to stop the sectioning process, there are two options. Where it says start and stop, uh, even though the word stops here rather than pause, you figure, oh, it'll stop immediately. Not true. It'll only stop once it's completed cutting and gone back to the starting position. If you hit pause, it'll stop immediately. So pause, counterintuitively, is the emergency stop. And beyond that, I think we're good. If you need to um, raise it because it's not cutting the sections, we can do that. And so we're gonna bring this back so that the blade is directly over the middle of these agarose chunks. And I'm going to use the up function to see when, when we're trying to look at it from this direction down here, when it's approximately touching the blade, which is about here, not much further up from where we started. So now I'm just going to hit start and it'll automatically start running. What we will also do is make sure that we have a brush in order to sweep up sections with. We don't need a large brush based on the size of these hemisected sections, so we should be fine. For now, it's going to be cutting through the agarose for a little bit, so we'll just ignore that fact. And we'll make sure to have our brush to sweep up sections when we need to. Most times people submerge their embedded glued brain chunks when they're in the virotomes basin slash stage. And so normally this is fine. Uh, we'll submerge it or immerse the chunks uh, on it, glued to the chuck, on the vibratome stage. We'll immerse all that into PVS or diluted PVS or saline, some sort of somewhat salty solution rather than just water or especially distilled water. And so the way that it works is that we'll usually cut, the section will float off, you'll catch it with a paintbrush, pick it up, put it into the well. Now, sometimes, there will be something that goes on. It might be due to the angling of the blade. It might be due to the speed that it's going, the vibration it's going, some various factors involved. But 
it might be too much trouble to troubleshoot. And you may have a problem of alternating thin and thick sections. So here I have depicted a picture of stained brain tissue, but let's imagine it's unstained uh, and that we're just sectioning it. So even though this example is coming from stained tissue where they had uh, produced a stroke in the tissue, let's imagine that this is also what can happen when we have good sections versus bad sections. So in A, this is what a normal good section, coronal section going through around the nucleus accumbens area would look like. And this is where it doesn't have alternating thickness between the top and the bottom section. Sometimes though, for some reason, the cuts go a certain way where part of the section is really thin or even incomplete, like shown in B, where one hemisphere might cut fine and then the other hemisphere is just like super thin, a big chunk of it's missing. It might not be even hemisphere specific. It might be where the top part is complete and then the bottom part isn't taken. And then the vibratome goes back and sections the next slice. And the next slice has an unusually thick part to it on the bottom. And it'll keep alternating like this where a piece is thin and incomplete, the next piece is thick. And the next piece after that is thin and incomplete, the next piece is thick. There are ways you could toy around with the vibratome to get around this. One of the things that people do to help with the sectioning process is embedding the brain chunks in agarose, as we've seen. Now, that will help guide the bleed, but that's assuming that the agarose has the same density as the brain tissue, or a density that is a little bit less than the brain tissue in some cases. So immersion in water, or immersion in PBS, or even diluted uh, in-betweens thereof, they can cause either shrinking or swelling of the agarose and cause density matching issues compared to the tissue. Uh, and this can cause further problems or even the agarose being there might not fully resolve the problem. So after toying around one day, what I found was by not putting any sort of um, fluid onto the chunks and the embedded uh, medium, it actually sectioned fine. So I was trying to section about 50 micrometer thick slices. We didn't have the thick versus thin problem with the vibratome anymore while I was sectioning them. I wouldn't say dry, but sort of dry. Um, so certainly not immersed. They were just there in the air. They were not dried out. So that's a key point. They were still kept somewhat moist, uh, but the agarose retains a lot of moisture. And as long as you cut without taking any sort of breaks, then it'll be all right. You won't have to worry about things drying out and becoming too dense to cut properly. So this worked out well for me. You can try it out if you're having the problem with thick and thin sections where like it doesn't section properly and you, unless you bring up the section thickness to like 80 micrometers, which is unreasonable in some cases or some applications. Uh, so we can get around that issue by just toying around with the consistency of the tissue or the embedding medium like I did here. One helpful thing that I've done is that I found that the agarose, if it's submerged in solution in this basin here, then I have some concerns that it actually will swell depending on the salinity in the basin, which can vary if it's like if you add water or add PBS. And I've actually found that the, the thick, thin section problem where it's like alternating, oh, you cut a thin section or it's like missing some parts and then you cut an extra thick section that seems to be ameliorated by the fact that um, I'm cutting it kind of, I wouldn't say dry, but like not submerged. So in other cases where we don't have the aggro, submerged might be fine. In this case, uh, not submerged has worked pretty well for me. Ideally, um, you want to let the blade go a little farther past where the aggro ends. So rather than having the blade end right around here, if you let it go a little farther out, it'll give you time to bring your brush in and swipe off the separate ones to then put them into separate wells. Let's talk about series sectioning. So sectioning in series is a way to minimize the use of tissue and maximize the amount of data we get out of it. Now, when we section tissue, we could just take all the sections from the hemisphere and cram them all into one well on a plastic well plate. And sure, we'd have all the tissue right there. 
and then we could stain all of it equally, all the same way, all at once, and then laboriously mount all of the sections onto dozens of microscope slides. Now we would have a picture of every single section of the brain and what is going on in each and every section based on whatever we're standing for. So again, if we did CFOS, we would have markers of activity for all of the neurons all across that one hemisphere of the brain. But that's a lot of extra information that we may not need. And at that point, we've also completely depleted all the tissue from one hemisphere. We don't need to look at all that tissue. It would take too long to look at all that tissue. Consider also that the way that Atlas pages are usually laid out, there are several uh, pieces of tissue, possibly many pieces of tissue that we could take between what each Atlas page depicts. So if the distance between an Atlas page and the next one is 120 micrometers, and we're taking tissue sections that are 30 micrometers, that easily is four pieces of tissue that go by before you have even changed the brain slightly as far as how it looks. So you may not be getting as much information or you're, you're getting actually a lot of information too much perhaps than what you would ever plan to use. So instead, what a lot of neuroanatomists do is that they separate the brain into series of sections. So you could get representatives from various brain regions, perhaps mass matching closely with specific atlas pages without having to take every and all slices in one staining round. For example, uh, series A could be delegated toward missile staining. Series B could be delegated toward CFOS staining. Series C could be delegated toward a more long-term marker like Delta FOS B. And series D could be just our backup series in case series A, B, or C failed for some reason. We got another one and could just run it through and everything's fine. Let's take a look at what that looks like, how that works. Now, virotone cuts, section comes out, we put it into first series, A. Again, next section goes to series B. Again, next section goes to series C. And again, next section goes to series D. We start over. And the next section goes back to series A. Next section after that goes to series B. Next section after that goes to series C. And next section after that goes to series D. And so we keep doing this until we've basically finished sectioning that brain chunk. And thus we can take these series in which the sections are a, um, a standardized distance apart. So if we're again sectioning 30 microns at a time, then the distance between the first section in the series and the next section will be about 120 micrometers because that uh, 30 times four is 120. So we'll know what the distance is between each of these sections. And that jump between the sections, that jump in the distance, let's say jump in Atlas pages, is not so much that we're really losing anything. So usually series of like four, five, maybe six might really get the most you can out of a given piece of brain, whether it's a whole hemisphere or whether it's less than that. So I do suggest that highly. Now, the exact number of how much you collect is up to you. Um, it certainly depends on whether you have many different stains and targets. And if you can't double stain for some reason in the same uh, series of tissue. So this is just reiterating what I mentioned previously, an example of how we could use series uh, to split up staining for different purposes. Now, another thing to consider is if the sections are frail, so we're using vibratoming. This is assuming that you're working with fixed tissue. It's relatively durable, especially when you're sectioning it at something like 40 micrometers. If you start to section it at 30 micrometers, the tissue is a little bit more frail. And if the fixation is poor, then the tissue becomes even more frail. So if you're trying to do even less than that, like 15 or 20 micrometers, I really don't suggest it for vibratoming because at a certain point, then the tissue becomes too frail to even work with. Now, we can section uh, larger sections of tissue, thicker, I should say, 
especially if we're doing something like free floating immunohistochemistry. So when we're doing free floating IHC, we'll be able to have the stains penetrate from both surfaces of a piece of tissue in about 40 micrometers. So that's 20 on each side, and that will get to the deepest depths of the tissue. This will allow for the tissue to be fully stained through. This might be particularly important for something like confocal microscopy, where if the tissue is too thick, you'll see like sort of a dead zone where there's no staining. So that'll happen at 50 micrometers and up for sure. Um, if you don't use any permeabilizing agents. And also if you're trying to use regular epifluorescent microscope, so a non-confocal type of thing, that'll be kind of tricky because the thicker sections will have more out of focus stuff, even at the lowest magnification like 4X. However, if your lab does staining, even if it's IHC staining or other types of staining, if your lab does staining on uh, slides where the sections are stuck to the slides, you really don't wanna go beyond 15 to 20 micrometers. Cause again, if it's 20 micrometers depth on each side, as far as like the upper limit, then you only have one side for everything to go through. The other side is stuck down to the slides. So they can't get through there. And with tissue that thin, it might be time instead to consider using a cryostat to section. Um, I don't usually like using the cryostat. I don't usually have to have sections this thin. I do all my stuff free floating. Uh, and you can do in situ hybridization free floating as well for those of you who do that sort of thing. But uh, again, if you need your sections to be thin or if you have a standardized way of staining that requires slides and sections to be stuck to those slides, then it might be cryostat for you. So right now it's cutting through. We'll want to make sure that we take a small wet paintbrush in order to swab off any sort of excess or sections. If it's excess agarus, we can just pick that up by swabbing and then wiping it off simply on a paper towel just because that's waste and that can be discarded later. You'll notice also we have well plates over here and in these we just put PBS. You could do PBS and azide, but we're not storing in this plate. We're gonna be moving it to another plate later. So here we'll have the hind brain or the back half of the brain in four series. So first section goes in first well. The next section from the next cut goes in the second well. Next section from the next cut, third well, fourth well, and so on. Simultaneously, though, we have cuts coming from the front of the brain, where we'll be putting them into a separate set of wells. First cut here, second here, third here, fourth here. So basically, with each sweep, we're taking up two separate sections to separate out. And we have the wells oriented so that things on the left go to this left column, things on the right go to the right column. Kind of need to make sure that if it's going at a quick rate, that if you need to pause it, you just hit the pause button because otherwise it will um, it'll drag the sections back over. So I'm just going to hit the pause button right here and then swab off this one here and then swab off the other one here. But this is part of the reason why you want to have this go a lot farther out to give you time to swipe the swipe um, and so on. Although agarose swelling might be a problem when cutting using the vibratome in that it'll be a different sort of uh, resistance and uh, uh, thickness compared to the brain. When we're working with uh, these agarose blocks and let's say you don't have time to cut them down or mount them or anything like that, you kind of lose track of time, you can always put the embedded blocks in the same solution container as where the brains went, especially if it's not formaldehyde. So in this case, this is PBS um, with sodium azide added at 0.05% solution. Uh, so yeah, this will be able to keep in the fridge just fine. And so you'll just make sure that when you take these out, you dry them off, you put that flat side down, uh, and you super glued in place and get to cutting. That's it for this video. If you have any comments, uh, feel free to leave them down in the comments section and let me know. Take care.